Hello everyone and welcome to a week of Linux news for the 9th of April 2017. We had the surprise news this week that a certain Linux distro was basically coming to an end in the way that we knew it and have known and loved it for some years. Yes, indeed. Uh, so yeah, it was the end of Red Hat Enterprise Linux version 5. And that includes CentOS version 5, the distro that came out in March 2007 and that has been supported all this time. So anyone using Red Hat 5 should have upgraded to Red Hat version 6 or version 7, which came out in 2010 and 2014 respectively. Okay, enough messing around. Yes, it was the end of a certain desktop this week, wasn't it? Windows is no longer the most popular end-user operating system. According to StatCounter, Android has surpassed Windows in terms of the most popular end-user operating system. At 37.93% versus Windows being 37.91%. 2017 certainly is the year of the Linux desktop. Okay, I know Android is a mobile phone, but technically that has a desktop. Hmm? In this article from ZDNet, they state that it marks the end of Microsoft's leadership worldwide OS market, which it has held since the 1980s. It also represents a major breakthrough for Android, which held just 2.4% of the global internet usage just five years ago. Wow, that is rapid growth there. And what has been driving the change? Well, they speculate it's to do with the growth of the Asian end user market. That said, StatCounter concedes the obvious, Windows still dominates the worldwide operating system desktop market, PC and laptop, with an 84% internet usage share in March. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Not quite the year of the Linux desktop just yet. Well, enough messing around. This was the rather sudden shock news I was referring to earlier in the video, and that no doubt you may have seen already this week, the end of the Unity desktop in Ubuntu. I don't want to go into this in too much detail here because I've already done two videos on it this week. But this was the post from Mark Shuttleworth in which he stated, I'm writing to let you know that we will end our investment in Unity 8, the phone and convergence shell. We will shift our default desktop back to GNOME for Ubuntu 18.04 LTS. Further investigation from the register has shown that Canonical had lost about 300 million pounds so that was probably a big reason why Unity 8 has been pulled. You have to appreciate that Canonical is a business and that any, well, underperforming areas of the company, in this case Unity and Convergence, are going to be cut. It does not necessarily represent the end of the Unity desktop because that has already been forked. The server and Internet of Things side of the company are doing rather well. But since they don't have a particular desktop, there is no reason to continue investing in Unity just for those couple of markets that Canonical are doing well in. It is not the end of Ubuntu, we will just see it now with a different desktop. In this case, GNOME. This news happened a little while back, but I thought it was only fair to bring it up, in that KDE Plasma has been ported to the Nexus 5X. I did mention in a previous video that the most likely route to convergence now for Linux lay with KDE. So this is more proof of it, that you can get the Plasma desktop on the Nexus 5X. I'm not sure which distribution they're referring to for this, but okay, the fact that we have the desktop working is kind of most of the answer. There is another Linux distribution called Maru OS, which is heading towards convergence. So just because we have lost the financial support for Unity does not mean mobile convergence in Linux is never going to happen. Techworm reports that there's a couple of new Dell Ubuntu laptops and that they're currently the most powerful laptops running Ubuntu Linux. So they've been named the Precision 7520 and 7720, and feature screen sizes of 15 and 17 inches respectively. They're not as thin as the Apple MacBook Pro. They use the Intel Kaby Lake processors, and you can choose from a Xenon E3 1505M or 1535M. And the laptops can be configured with either a 1080p or 4K display and can have up to 64 gig of DDR4 memory and 3 terabytes of storage. So they come with an Nvidia GPU and there is a starting price of 1,247 US dollars. Very nice, very nice indeed. From SC Magazine, Amnesia Botnet targeting DVRs. 
Unit 42 researchers at Palo Alto Networks announced the detection of a new variant of Internet of Tat Linux botnet Tsunami, which they are referring to as Amnesia. The Amnesia botnet looks for an unpatched remote code execution vulnerability affecting digital video recorder appliances manufactured by China-based TVT Digital. The researchers believe that this is the first Linux malware to adopt virtual machine evasion techniques to defeat malware analysis sandboxes. Not only that, should the code recognize that it is run in a VirtualBox, VMware, or Kimu based virtual machine, it will wipe the virtualized Linux system by deleting all files in the system. Ouch, lethal. Okay, this is not like every Linux system in the world is vulnerable, it is only targeting a specific Internet of TAS device. Some people have asked me before how these devices can be open on the firewall unless they're specifically open by the user. Well, now it comes down to plug and play settings on the firewall. By default, many of these awful devices just request unnecessary ports to be opened on the firewall, and they can be hit very quickly from the outside world. Some news that did happen last week, but has gained more traction this week in the national press, that Amazon are banning sales of pirate Kodi media players from their website. This is one of the better articles on the subject from Torrent Freak, and they report that Amazon is taking a tough stance against vendors who sell fully loaded Kodi boxes and other pirate media players for its platform. The store now explicitly bans media players that promote or suggest the facilitation of piracy. Sellers who violate this policy, of which there are still a few around, risk having their inventory destroyed. While Kodi itself is a neutral platform, millions of people who use the third-party add-ons to turn it into the ultimate piracy machine. In some cases, the pirate add-ons are put onto the devices by vendors who sell these fully loaded boxes through their own stores or marketplaces such as Amazon. While Amazon has never explicitly allowed the sale of copyright infringing devices, they are not hard to find in its store. I actually think this is a really good move from Amazon because it is just going to ruin it for the rest of us who just want to use it as a media player for playing files from, well, their own system. If you have a look at Cody's Twitter feed, they're absolutely fed up with people who write to them complaining about these piracy media players not working. A little bit of gaming news. Daedalic Entertainment will be bringing Ken Follett's Pillars of the Earth to Linux. I had no idea this book had been made into a game, I'm only mentioning it because I really like the book. It is absolutely enormous. <laughs> I can't remember how many pages now, but it's um, quite a few hundred pages in that novel. Anyway, it is interesting seeing more games being brought to Linux. And finally, this week's stupid news. Wi-Fi sex toy with built-in camera fails penetration test. <laughs> oh, I've got to trust the register to put in a funny title. Sex toy designer Svarcom decided that a vibrator needed a camera on the end and also needed a Wi-Fi access point with utterly predictable result, the device is hackable. The pen test partners took a look at the device and researchers probably wish they hadn't because the Svarcom CMI is an early favourite for the hypothetical 2007 Worst Internet of Shit Product Award. Looking at the Android app, pen test partner researchers first turned up some hard-coded credentials and hard-coded IP addresses. The hard-coded credentials, admin blank, make it trivial to connect to the Dildo's web admin interface. And even better, the web app serves the video from the camera and because it's an access point, an attacker within range can identify users. And there is a little bit more about it, but uh, basically the pen test partners were able to siphon the video stream from the dildo, meaning that someone's most intimate activities are badly protected. So, well done. So I'm wondering, do we have another potential botnet on our hands? Uh, yeah, a botnet made out of sex toys. Can't wait for that to be seen in the national press. And how embarrassing will it be for a company to admit their web servers are being attacked by such devices? Yep, can't wait to see it. Anyway, thanks for watching, I'll see you all later.